well. Today we are uh, kicking off a new sermon series, a short series, um, that I've used the last few years to kind of kick off the beginning of every year. And, and of course now you're saying, well, it's not the very beginning of the year, Pastor. Well, I understand that. I was gone the first week in the Dominican. Second week we talked about the Dominican. Now we're finally to, so to speak, my first Sunday of the year. So uh, we, will, we will kick it off today. And um, this is a, a thing that we have done, as I said, uh, the last three years. And we have, and I think I have one here, um, printed out for you if you would like one of these. We printed out 50 of these. These are a guide. Uh, uh, it's not quite a, well, I guess there's a journal portion. There's a, a guide for the prayer portion of, of what we are doing here. And so there's readings for each day, something to think about, then a place for you to give your response. And, and these were developed. Many of you know the guy who wrote these. This is put together by Dana Olson. Uh, Dana used to be uh, the director of prayer for all of the Baptist General Conference, uh, or Converge as we're known now. Um, so Dana oversaw all the prayer initiatives for the entirety of our denomination and is now actually a pastor of uh, Faith Baptist Church in Sioux Falls. And um, he put this together. And if you don't know Dana, Dana is a wonderful man just in and of himself, but, but truly a man of prayer. And if you want to learn how to pray, this is a man who... Um, you, you really, really would benefit from spending some time with because uh, he, he's just a, a man of prayer, a powerful prayer, a really, really amazing testimony of faith and, and just great stories that he can share and just, just a neat guy all around. And so if you ever get to Sioux Falls, I, I highly recommend Dana and his church, a great place to go and a great guy just to study and learn from and, and just a, a blessing if you have a chance to be with him for a prayer meeting or something. Uh, he will truly bless you through that. And so um, my sermons will not directly correspond to any of the specific readings. We're going to be talking about prayer more broadly and more generally um, than some of the things that are in here. But, but if you go through this over the next 21 days, I, I promise you, you will be blessed through it. And this is something that, that many, many, many converge, and, and actually churches outside of converge are doing. In fact, um, I've got some friends who are pastors up in Thief River Falls, and, and the community of evangelical churches in Thief River Falls have all come together to do this together. So the Covenant Church, the Converge Church, a number of other churches are all doing this together. And they've created a, a community-wide prayer page on Facebook that they're, they're posting things and praying for one another together with. And so that's pretty cool. And so we have brother and sister churches all over the country who are doing this as well now. Most of us do it kind of here at the beginning of the year, although we do certainly have the option to do it whenever we want. But there are quite a few churches, if you were to go online and look for 21 Days of Prayer, you'll find churches all over the country who are working through these same materials simultaneously. And, and I find that kind of encouraging to know that other people are, are learning and reading and growing at the same things that we are doing. And so, so I kind of like that. And, and of course, I love starting the year off with prayer because as we're going to be talking about, the power of God is in prayer. And if we want to connect with God and we want to have God in our lives and we want to have God in our church and we want to have God in our country, it's only going to happen through the power of prayer. If we don't pray, nothing can happen. If we don't pray, it, it's our prayers that... that, that literally unleash and unlock God's blessing that he has planned for us, he has in store for us, yet he's chosen to have this mechanism where we communicate with him and he communicates with us and it's called prayer. And so we need to be involved in that. And so today we're going to be in Ephesians 3. If you brought a Bible, feel free to open up to that. That's where I'm going to be pretty much exclusively writing is Ephesians 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs. There's some in the Welcome Center. You're welcome to take home the ones that are on the Welcome Center. Those are a gift to you if you don't have one. Otherwise, iPads, iPhones, whatever you got, feel free to use. But Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14, is where we're going to be at. And, and, and while you're finding that, uh, how many of you would say that, that I absolutely, Pastor, believe in the power of prayer, yet I don't pray as much as I should? Yeah? Yeah? I think that's most of us, right? I believe in the power of prayer, but I don't pray as much as I should. And, and, and why is it that when we, 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 we know that we have this good God, right? This God who answers the prayers of His children, yet so many of us as His children don't pray as we know that we should, right? Why is that? Well, I think there's several reasons why, of course. 
Um, some people honestly don't know how to pray. I, I used to be there. When, when, I was, when I was a new Christian, and in fact, sadly, for quite a number of years as a Christian, I really didn't know how to pray. I'd hear people pray. And, and way, way back, even before I was a Christian, I went through confirmation growing up, and I learned the Lord's Prayer, so I had memorized that prayer, right? But I, I really didn't know how to pray, other than, you know, I knew it should start with something like God, Father, or Jesus, and it should end with Amen, right? Everything in between, kind of nebulous and fuzzy to me. So, so some people don't know how to pray, and, 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 and sometimes it just comes from, you know, that, that, that lack of confidence, right? Like, like am, I, am, I, am I doing this right? Uh, well, yeah, you, if you're talking to God, you're doing it right. You know, so I would encourage you. You don't have to have some fancy words or magic potions or formulas or any of that kind of stuff. Just talk with God. Start there, and you'll grow from that. But, uh, but wondering if you're doing it right or not knowing what you're doing can certainly be a barrier. Um, a, a, another barrier, if we're quite honest, is that sometimes... We get bored when we pray, don't we? Does that happen to anybody other than me? I've gotten bored when I was praying. Now, I don't think that's a reflection on the goodness of God. I think that's on me, right? But I, I kind of hate to admit it as a pastor. I have at different times in my life gotten bored praying, right? And in fact, I've even fallen asleep while praying. Don't tell, right? Anybody else ever fallen asleep while praying? Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking like... So sometimes, like, if I can't sleep at night, I'm laying in bed, it's like four in the morning, I'll start praying. I'm not talking about that. That's not the prayers I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I sat down to pray for you. Sorry, I didn't get it out. Right? I fell asleep. That happens. Or maybe a lot of you are, are kind of like me, right? I can kind of be like an ADD preacher, pastor, prayer guy, right? Where, where it's like, I have all these great intentions. I'm like, dear God, I'm praying for a miracle. Miracle whip. I could use a sandwich. I'm kind of hungry. Ooh, look, something shiny. Right? Anybody else have that problem when you pray? You're like, where did that come from? I was praying and now I'm hungry for turkey sandwiches. But, but that's the way we can be a lot of times, right? Or, 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 or another one that happens. Sometimes... You ever gotten intimidated hearing somebody pray? I've gotten intimidated. I've heard people pray and you're just like, dude, that was frighteningly amazing, right? Like, have you ever gone to somebody's house and had them pray before a meal? And, 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 and like, before you eat, they're, they're like, they're praying, but they're like quoting scripture and they're like, dear God, in the name of Jesus, uh, like you said in Deuteronomy 28, you know, like, like we're blessed coming in, we're blessed going out, we're the head, we're not the tail, and he's calling down angels and he's casting out demons while he's praying before your dinner, and you're like, whoa, what just happened here? And you're like, dude, that was good. Right? You ever experienced that? Well, well the danger in that is I'm a competitive guy. Now, now like, like, he comes to my house, I, 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 I got to get to that, that level, right? You ever been competitive in prayer? Ever been at a prayer meeting where you're like, now I really got to pray something good. They, they, they just really, they really dropped the prayer bomb. And, and sometimes you pray kind of goofy things in those moments. You're like, dear Jehovah Nisan, um, Nisan, that's not one of the names of God. It's the name of a car. But uh, uh, thank you, God. You're like a good neighbor. Um, you're always there. Lord, Lord, I, I love your word because it, it melts in my mouth and not in my hands. Um, you know, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that's thicker than water. And, you know, and you start rolling some of those out because you're trying to keep up with somebody else's prayers, Right? Don't feel inadequate about prayer. If somebody's got some amazing prayers, praise God. But prayer is communicating with God. And however you communicate with God, the key is communicate with God. Um, the, the rest of the stuff, if you're, if you're not confident, if you're not comfortable, if you don't know the words, if you don't know the formulas, if you don't know all that stuff, that doesn't matter. Know God and talk to Him, right? That's, that's what prayer is. And that's not what the message really today is about, but I want to make sure everybody hears that kind of as the foundational idea before we get too far along the way talking about prayer. 
and, and now maybe I've damaged my reputation with you telling you all my secrets about my inadequacies with prayer, but hopefully you'll come along with me on this journey in prayer. Because for the next 21 days, I want us to be a people of prayer. I want us to be a people of prayer every day, but especially for the next 21 days. Uh, I want you to invest in this. Uh, uh, it's called Praying the King's Agenda. And I really think by going through these 21 days of prayer, it will draw you closer to Jesus. It'll make your prayer life stronger. It'll make your family stronger because you're praying. It'll make our church stronger because you're praying. It'll make our community better because you're praying. And that, I think, is really what we want to be about. And so we want to start this year off as a people of prayer. And I want to start today off by by. by sharing with you what I believe to be two big prayer mistakes that so many of us tend to make. And if you're taking notes, here you go, they're right there in your bulletin for you. And it says, the very first one is, our our big first big prayer mistake is, so often our prayers are simply too small. And then the second one is, our prayers frequently are too general. And when we, when we pray to God, I believe that for so many of us, our, our prayers are too small and they're too general. And, and sometimes I honestly think that, that God might even almost be a little bit frustrated with the lack of faith that so many of us have in what we pray for. You know, I mean, for, for example, so many of us will pray things like, God, thank you for this day, right? I pray that you would bless me or I pray that, pray that you would breath bless so-and-so. But I, I kind of wonder almost if, if God isn't going... Have you looked around? I mean, have you noticed the part of the world that you live in? That blessing part's already taken care of, right? I, I, I've already blessed you. I've already blessed her. I, I've already blessed him, right? And I'm happy to do it. But maybe you could uh, bring a little something more when you're praying, right? Or, or maybe you just pray like, oh God, will you just be with us today, right? That's eh, not a bad prayer. I'm not saying don't pray that, but go to the next level, go to the next step. I mean, just saying, God, will you be with you? Well, yes. I mean, this is the very same God who says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So I think if you believe in God and you trust God, you can believe he's going to be with you today, right? So maybe, maybe we take it to that next level because God's already going yeah I've already promised you those things I'm already blessing you I'm already with you right I got that that's easy give me something big right I almost see God up there going there's got to be more than that right and so often our our, our prayers are are are, are small our our prayers aren't aren't specific. They're just very broad and very general. And I think if we work at it, we could bring so much more to our prayer lives. And as we do this, as we begin to pray bigger prayers and as we begin to pray more specific prayers, what that does is it allows God to show off His glory. If we're just praying, yeah, God bless me. Well, He already has. How is He going to really show his radiance and glory when he's already done that no no pray something very very specific that that he can act and he can work and that he can do something and he can unleash his blessing into the world in you and through you through those prayers and i, and I almost wonder if our lack of specificity our lack of uh, of broadness of our prayers almost insults god like like almost like well I'd pray for something bigger, but I'm not sure if God will do it, right? You ever done that? You ever prayed like that? Like, like, I want to pray for this, but I don't know if I can ask that. You know, it's one thing going to your boss and saying, hey, I'd like you to double my salary next year, right? Boss might look at you a little weird if you try that. But you can pray things like that to God. And sometimes God answers. Now, I'm not saying God's going to double your salary next year. Don't hear that and don't go home and tell your boss I said that. It's not what I'm saying. But sometimes we, 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 we literally leave something on the table because our prayers aren't big enough. Many of us pray small and very generic, general prayers. And I want to encourage you to pray big and to pray specific prayers because general prayers do not move God to specific actions. I want to say that again. 
General prayers do not move God to specific action. James, the brother of Jesus, says, we have not because we ask not, right? What I want to do is, I want to ask God for very specific requests that, 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 that require me to have the faith to believe that He can do those things that, that would otherwise be absolutely impossible. I want to pray for things that are far beyond my ability. If I'm only praying for things that I can already do, where is there room for God to work? Where is there room to trust God? If I could already do it, why am I even asking God for it? We need to pray big prayers. I'll give you an example of one such prayer. I'll tell you, and I was kind of joking a little bit about it before, prayer is not my natural gifting. Never been like, like Dana Olson, right? I've met Dana, I know Dana. You meet somebody who's a person of prayer and you're like, you know they are, Right? We got some people on our prayer team. They're definitely people of prayer. Some of you are people of prayer. You're better praying than I am, right? You are. That's okay. I can't be good at everything. And and prayer just is one of those things I've never been like. If you were to have like the spiritual chart graph of various giftings, I'm at very best kind of in the middle of the road when it comes to prayer. And that's only after lots of years of practice and working hard, right? I'm just never going to be a superstar prayer warrior, intercessory prayer monster, just amazing person. I, 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 it's just not me. I'm going to keep working that direction. I'm going to keep trying, but I just, it's never been my gifting. But some of you have got that. But for most of us, it takes some work, right? And, and, and so I love to read about people who, who are above me and beyond me in, in different stages of life. But, and, and prayer is no different. And, and, and they, they inspire me to, to raise my game to their level, to try to get better at the thing that I'm trying to learn. And, and in specifically, uh, talking about prayer, one of, the, one of the guys whose prayers that I've read some of and stories about is Martin Luther, right? Now, we all know who Martin Luther is to some degree, but, but uh, Martin Luther is kind of the, the, the father of the Reformation as we think about it. And, and one of the things that I read about him is, is this interaction that he had with this guy by the name of Frederick Myconius. Now, Myconius was kind of his right-hand man, so to speak. Uh, he was his assistant for, for Luther. And um, he'd been helping him. He'd been serving him. When, when Luther kind of had to go underground, if you don't know Luther's backstory, he started as a priest. Ended up leaving the Catholic Church, uh, you know, the whole Witten, Wittenberg door with, you know, 95 Thesis on the door. And then eventually uh, the, the, the Pope kind of comes down on him and then he has to go into hiding. And, um, and so his life is kind of being threatened, literally. Like people want to kill him because of the things that he's saying about faith and following God and following Jesus. Well, Myconius is one of those guys who helped him during that season. Uh, and, and in 1540... Myconius fell deathly ill um, and, and was literally on his deathbed. And so, so he, he has this letter he dictates to, to Martin Luther that gets sent to him. And, and, it, and it's effectively a, a farewell letter to Martin Luther. And he's saying, you know, the end is near. I, I, I love you, brother, and, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not going to get to see you again. I'm sorry. I'm kind of maybe letting you down a little bit because I'm not going to be able to finish this journey with you. And we've done so much good work. And, oh, I had these great hopes of seeing you do greater things yet. And uh, yet I'm going to die. So blah, blah, blah. And he, and, he, and, he, and he sends this letter off to him, right? Well, Luther gets this letter. And Luther's like, uh, uh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, uh-uh. I, 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 I'm not, not going to have it, right? And so in, instead of praying like these little, you know, I'll, I'll pray that, 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 that you go quickly and that uh, I'll pray that you won't suffer in your last days or something like that. No, that's not what Luther prays. Uh, Luther writes back and he says, this is my prayer for you. And he says this, I have commanded you in the name of God to live because I have need for you to work in the reforming of the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive beyond me. That is which I am praying for, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. So that was the letter Luther writes in response to him, kind of saying, well, I'm going to die. No, I will have none of it, right? 
That's a big, specific prayer by Luther, saying, no, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to let God let you die. No, you can't die. I need you. That's what I'm praying for. And what's even crazier is, by the time Maconius gets this letter back from Luther, he had lost the ability to speak. I mean, he was at death's door. He was the very final days of his life that they thought, anyhow. And so they get this letter, they bring it in, they read it to him, and he hears this. And, and they're thinking, this guy is like hours away from death. And, and literally, after he hears this, the man is miraculously healed. And, and, and for the next six years, he works toiling for Martin Luther. And eventually outlives Luther himself, just as Luther had prayed. He dies two months after Luther dies. That's how specific the response was to a specific and faith-filled prayer by a man who had enough faith to believe that, that if he would pray it, that God might answer it. That all things are possible with God. Now, just because you pray it is not a promise that God will answer it. I don't ever hear that. That's not what we believe. But so oftentimes we don't pray it. Because we're afraid that God can't or won't do it. And because we didn't pray, he doesn't. And that is on us, says James. We have not because we pray not. And what we're going to do over the next few weeks is, is we're going to look at some different texts that the Apostle Paul has written. And, and if you don't know, Paul used to be Saul, right? Uh, he was this guy who persecuted Christians, killed Christians, hated Christians. Then he, met, he was met with the grace of Jesus and was transformed and would go on to start churches all over the Mediterranean, right? And would eventually lose his life because of his faith. And then Paul kind of had this way in his letters, and the way in which he would pray. And he'd pray over people and over churches and over things. Kind of had a pattern and a rhythm to his prayers. And he would do, what he would do is he would say, like, like, like I pray... And then he would say what I pray for. He'd say, like, I pray blank, blah, 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 so that. And then he gives the reason why he's praying for it. And you see this again and again and again throughout his epistles. Epistles is a fancy word for letters, right? And so you, you see this kind of rhythm and pattern to how he writes about who and what he's praying for. And what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to learn to pray for some of these same specific things that, that Paul was praying for. And hopefully it will inspire us and draw us to be closer to God and to be deeper and richer in our prayer lives. We're going to pray things like, God, this is, this is the very reason I ask you to do this, so that this would happen. Right? Specific, big prayers. And the very first prayer, as I said, we were going to talk about, comes from Ephesians 3. So if you're, if you're willing, open up your Bibles there, Ephesians 3. Uh, and Ephesians was written by Paul. Paul was in uh, prison at the time that he wrote this, uh, somewhere around 60 AD. Uh, Paul was imprisoned, and he writes this to the church at Ephesus from a Roman prison, and, and he starts his prayer this way in Ephesians 3.14. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now when you pray... It's an important thing to know that you can pray in many different positions and many different postures. Paul, Paul specifically says here that he's kneeling, but you can stand and pray, you can kneel and pray, you can lay down and pray, although be careful when you do that, because you may be like me and you'll fall asleep, right? I like to pray when I'm driving. That's one of the ways that I ensure hopefully I don't fall asleep while I'm praying. But uh, I've told you these stories before, but one of the things I used to do when I lived in the cities, at least, is I used to have a, a prayer list on my dash, and whenever I was at a red light, I'd pray for those things. Now, of course, I'd pray with my eyes open so I could see when the light would turn green. I didn't want to be that guy that everybody's honking at. But, but in the cities, I'd spend enough time at stoplights that that was actually a useful use of my time. That I'd sit there and just pray for people. And I'd get through my prayer list a couple times a lot of days. And so it was a, a useful use of my time. But uh, you, you can pray in all sorts of different ways in all sorts of different places. Now, back at the time of Paul, one of the most common ways that a Jewish man would normally pray was, was simply to stand and, and you would put your hands up, right? And, and you would pray. 
Um, I would encourage you over the next 21 days, find different ways and different places in which to pray. If you always pray at one time at one place, that's awesome. But maybe mix it up a little bit. Throw something new in there. Try a different position, a different posture, a different place. Pray somewhere new. Pray somewhere different and, and see what that kind of maybe does for you. Maybe, maybe stand like the Jewish men used to and put your palms out and just pray. It's hard to fall asleep when you're standing. Right? And so maybe you'll be blessed in that. And then as we continue on reading in verse 16, Paul prays and he says that, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, right? You see here that, that Paul is acknowledging that, that God has already made every possible spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms available to us as his children. See, we serve an infinitely rich Father in heaven. Everything is his already. It's all his. He's got it all. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? He's got all power. He's got everything. It's already his. Yet, so many of us live like, like impoverished children instead of children of the Father of the God who has everything. We live as if he doesn't. We pray as if he doesn't have it all. But we serve a God who has it all. Every spiritual blessing is available to us as His children. And He loves to give us good gifts. He desires to give us His blessings. But so often we pray these general and small prayers. So begin to ask big prayers, faith-filled prayers, specific prayers, and see that, that God delights in blessing His children, just as it says, out of His glorious riches. Then Paul says this, he says, so that, so that God may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being. You see, God wants us to experience His power. And the way we access God's power is through prayer. Why should we want to do that? Well, look at verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now that word that Paul uses there for power in the Greek is a word called dunamis. And and it's the very same word we get our word dynamite from, right? I don't know if you've ever handled dynamite or any explosive of any sort. Uh, I've, I've had... I don't know if it's the blessing, the opportunity to handle a number of different explosives at different times. Uh, Some you don't worry too well. Well, all the ones I've handled were pretty stable. But I remember, you know, the old days of the nitroglycerin, the old TNT, the old dynamites that, that would separate and become very volatile. Like, you know, they used to find these, they'd go into old mining caves and find boxes of dynamite where where it had oozed out of the the sticks of dynamite and had separated itself and become an an unstable thing. And any, you know, loose rock could potentially cause an explosion because of it. Um, And that's the same word that we have here. Dunamis, dynamite, explosion, power. And that word power in the Greek really literally means that. It means that when we pray, we can unleash the explosive, miraculous power of God. It's not like human power. It's the power of God. And my prayer for you in the days and weeks to come is going to be that God would strengthen all of you with dunamis, with supernatural prayer power that's available to you. But you have to pray for that power. Will you pray for that? Pray for it. Paul continues on in verse 17, and he says, I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love. If I want my my roots planted in anything, it's the love of Jesus that I want my roots to be in. Why root them there? Well, look at verse 18. So that we may have the strength or power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. Did you get that? This is so that we can begin 
just a little bit to understand so that we can just get a little grasp of just how much God loves us. You see, on our own, we cannot fully comprehend how much God loves us. It has to be supernaturally revealed to us. Our, our limited, our, our small, our finite minds do not have the capacity on their own to comprehend how much God loves us. That's why one of the very most important prayers that you can pray for your children, for your grandchildren, would that, that, that God would give them the power to just simply begin to understand even a little bit of just how much He loves them. If you're not praying for your kids and your grandkids that they would know how much God loves them, begin to pray that. God, I pray that my son would know how much you love him. I pray that my granddaughter, she would know how much you love her. Because you see, when that begins to take root, when our children, when our grandchildren, we ourselves begin to understand how much he loves us, we begin to seek our approval from him and not from the world, right? We begin to find our our value from him and not the things of this earth. It helps us resist the temptations of of being sucked into the things of this world and to stand strong on the Word of God when we root ourselves in how much He loves us. And with God, love is not what He does, but love is who He is. It's the essence of who our God is. It's one of the fundamental characters of God. God is love love. And and when you recognize that is who He is, then you can stand firm uh, on the strength of there's nothing I can do to make Him love me more. And, And also, good news, there's nothing I can do to make Him love me less. Right? Hear me. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more or to make Him love you less. Because He's infinitely and perfectly and fully love. He loves you. And if the world would understand that, they would stop seeking love from so many other things that will always disappoint. He doesn't love me because of what I do. He loves me because of who He is. When I understand that, Christianity is is not something that I do on Sunday. It's the essence of who I am. I am a Christ follower. I have a a power that dwells within me so that, that Christ lives in my inner being. And when I realize that, suddenly I'm no longer living for the things of this world. And that's where we can get that that peace that surpasses understanding. It's the power of God. And we access it through prayer. So you pray big prayers. You pray specific prayers. You believe in a a God who says, all things are, are possible through me. And as you do that, your faith will begin to grow and it'll keep growing and growing and growing. Because within that, you will have seen the power of the risen Christ. And you will have that power dwelling within you. Let me show you how Paul wraps all of this up. He basically says this. He says, that you may be full. That you may have the full measure of all that God has for you. And then in verse 20, it's almost, it's almost, like, an, it's almost like an anthem. Then he says, now to Christ who is able to do what? to do immeasurably more, abundantly more, infinitely more. In other words, you can't even begin to measure how much God is able to do, Paul is saying. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ask or imagine. Can you 
believe that? Can you picture in your mind for just a second the greatest thing you could imagine God doing? And He can do something greater than that. You can't even fathom what He could do. And according to what? According to His power at work within you. Did you catch that? God's power, Paul says, if you were praying, is at work within you. Within you, within me, within all of us. And then Paul closes it with, Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God can and will do greater things than we can imagine if we will just simply believe and ask in prayer. He does this so that it is abundantly clear that the things that happened were because He showed up, not because of something that I did. So that He gets the glory and not me. So that people will see that He has the power that we don't. We need to pray for that. Are you willing to do that over the next few weeks? Pray big, specific prayers because General prayers do not move God to specific actions. Pray that God shows up and that God shows off in your life, in our church, in ways that will point to His power and to His glory, to His majesty and not to ours. I believe that God has great things in store for us, but we need to pray for them. We can do this. Amen? Let's start right now. Let's pray.